No worries. Listen, we're going to keep this introduction really short because I know we've eaten into your uh, time. So welcome, everybody. Um, I'm going to minimize my conversation on the call today is, is Diego, who's going to be leading us through a very interesting chat about uh, uh, learning modules for time and series. Uh, Diego has a wealth of, uh, of, of, of publications, awards that go back to the early 90s. Um, I think he's at about three or four different universities now, including um, the Department of Industrial, Industrial Engineering and Management Science at Northwest University. He also uh, contributes at Georgia Institute of Technology, the University of Illinois. In 2012, he was promoted to a full pro professor. Um, and his research is really focused on machine learning, deep learning, and analytics, modeling methodologies, theoretical uh, results. Um, worked across industries, finance, manufacturing, insurance, sports, bio. Uh, worked with names as big as Intel, Baxter, Allstate, and has also got a number of uh, startups under his belt, including most recently OPEX, and something that's in the works that I, I'm not sure if we're allowed to talk about it. But either way, Diego, uh, over to you, my friend. Very excited to hear what you have to say today. Uh, wealth of experience. I'm looking forward to what you have to say. Thank you so much, Diego. Uh, I'm going to put myself on mute. Over to you, my friend. For all those on the call, please put your questions into the chat, and we will collect them. Thank you, Stuart. I assume I'm audible and you see my screen. Uh, we can see you. We can see, uh, hear you. I uh, haven't seen a share screen, but it should be the icon just down at the bottom next to the microphone. Well, I think I did that. Uh, next to yeah. the microphone. So at the bottom of your screen, there should be three icons, a uh, camera, oh, okay, okay. a microphone, and then, and then a line. Okay. It should have a red line through it. Yeah, OK. Got it. All right. How about now? There you go. Perfect. We can see your screen, Diego. Thank you so much. All right. I apologize about a delay, technical problems on my side. It was completely my fault. All right. So let me try to. Uh, uh, so I need to gain sort of about ten minutes. All right. So Stuart just uh, told you about myself. So I'm a professor in uh, at Northwestern University. Uh, I'm the founding director of the Master of Science in Analytics, and I'm also director of the Center for Deep Learning. All right. So also I have to cover. The last bullet point, this is joint work. What I'm about to present is a joint work with uh, Mark Harmon, who graduated uh, about two years ago, Lida Zhang, uh, who was a student of mine also about a year ago, and Dani Ibrahimi, who is a uh, current uh, PhD student of mine. So roots, or in other words, sort of how did all this uh, research started? And this is where um, we're actually sort of, again, a lot of uh, exposure, uh, or I should actually say recognition in the finance work, because together with a quarter, actually, uh, Matthew Dixon uh, from uh, in, uh, Illinois Institute of Technology, sort of, uh, what was this, about five years ago, we were one of the first ones that actually used deep learning to predict uh, asset prices. And at that time, essentially, we were just using straightforward, feedforward network. All right. So, but the novelty there was that it was a uh, it was a deep network, and at that time, uh, people have uh, kind of barely started looking into this. All right. So, and this is kind of schematics, where sort of usually, I mean, if you go through the regular process, you have to uh, you have to uh, do feature engineering, and then you have to select your uh, feature, uh, and it becomes sort of the entire pipeline becomes very tedious. Right, so with deep learning, sort of, we just simply tossed to the model around 10,000 features, uh, and they were sort of features were just kind of straightforward features, so moving averages, pairwise correlations of return, and then the deep learning model took care of that. So that was five years ago, but we were not happy with this because we know that time series data or uh, financial data has an inherent, uh, inherent sort of time series component, right? So which essentially implies that that one should use uh, models and architectures that actually rely on time series. And this is what's going to be the focus of, uh, of my talk. All right. So uh, there are two motivations. Right? So I'm going to tackle two aspects. So the first aspect is, is the following. So when you are, so think, okay, so what is the problem that we are, we are uh, actually tackling here? So we have N uh, stocks. Right, so and we want to predict, and clearly they are correlated, right? So and we want to predict their prices, right? So so this is not about. So ultimately, the goal here is to embed this forecasting engine into uh, into a trading strategy. But it's uh, uh, so that that's our goal. Uh, so far, we have not yet achieved that because because uh, coming up with with uh, uh, with simulations for such evaluations, it's 
it's not that simple. All right, so think about it. So we have N stocks and we need to predict their prices, All right? So now, uh, okay, so let's say, okay, so granularity sort of now we are, we are not into high speed trading, uh, but uh, let's say some sort of algorithmic trading, uh, you wanna make predictions and let's say a minute, uh, a minute in the future, right? So, but uh, maybe not just one minute, maybe sort of 10 minutes, five minutes or anywhere somewhere in between say, I don't know, one and 15 minutes, all right? So the, the main uh, question here is, all right, so we are to make a prediction, but should we make a prediction one minute in advance, two, three, 10 minutes in advance? And can we come up with a model that's going to automatically determine how far in the future uh, uh, we should, uh, 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 how, should, how far in the future the model should predict in a reliable way? All right, so that's that's one one motivation. All right, so um, so when, for example, when uh, uh, when you have a stable uh, business environment, right, so or economic actually, when you have a stable economic environment, so then the model probably is going to be quite uh, robust and quite uh, confident, and it should make predictions. I don't know, 10, 15, 20 minutes in uh, in the into the future. But when there's a lot of volatility, well. Maybe even uh, perhaps sort of even a minute into the future, it's going to be uh, very questionable. All right. So, so this is the so our goal here is: can we come up with a model that's going to automatically, dynamically, actually uh, assess how far in the future it should predict? All right. So now the challenge here is that we don't really have supervised. Uh, we don't really have ground truth. We don't, we don't have the labels that tell us. All right. So uh, for this particular sequence uh or, or in this particular time uh the environment is stable so predict sort of 20 uh, uh 20 minutes in advance but in a different one just one minute in advance so there's no such notion right so all you have you have historical uh, uh historical stock prices with with nothing that tells you how far into the future you want to uh you want to forecast all right so that's the first challenge all right so the second the second thing that we want to uh, uh, tackle here and, and I want to cover is do all samples actually need the same architecture? And now I have I have now quite a few work, uh, quite a few students that are working on this uh, problem in a, in a different uh, in different settings. All right. So uh, so this goes kind of uh, uh, back to to the previous uh, question, but tackled from a different angle. All right. So so before it was how far in the future we want to predict. Now the question is, you can also tackle when, when you have a lot of volatility, then it's going to be hard to make predictions, which means that you want to have a complex net. But when you, uh, but when, when it's easy to make predictions, the network should be relatively simple, All right? So the question now is, can, can one design an architecture that for some sample is going to be uh, sim uh, is going to be a simple architecture, but for other samples, it's going to be a very complex architecture. So this, the underlying model should automatically uh, adjust uh, based on the complexity of the uh, of the environment and the samples that sort of at what time the samples are actually being drawn. All right. So here, so I, I wrote so when when you have stable environment, then it should be simple network. But when VIX goes to the roof. Sort of a lot of volatility, then you probably want to have a complex network, right? So in this icon here, it's supposed to show the uh, the notorious uh, uh, ice cap, right? So half of it below the water, half of it uh, underneath the water, and you don't know what happens beneath the water. So that corresponds to uh, high volatility and and sort of harder to make predictions. All right. So uh, first we started. So all the subsequent work that I'm going to present today relies on the standard sort of CNN LSTM type architecture, right? So uh, you can uh, you can question now why not transformers? Well, so this work actually started kind of uh, uh, when transformers were relatively uh, early, uh, but uh, the ideas that I'm about to present sort of they carry over to transformers as well, right? So we used. Uh, so in all of the experiments, sort of, we use uh, CNN plus uh, LSTM. All right, so you see CNN to get uh, uh, kind of sliding windows. Uh, you extract CNN extract features, and then you feed those features into LSTM, and LSTM then makes predictions. All right, so let me stress at this point: we are talking about one single model 
for several stocks, right? So the model will automatically uh, take into account or should automatically take into account the un underlying possible correlations, All right? So let's first uh, uh, study or not study, but address, let's first address the, uh, the latter problem, which is how do we come up with an architecture that's going to, uh, uh, with a model that's going to dynamically select an underlying architecture. Right, so in here is just so I'm not going to bother you with mathematical details. Sort of, there's there's math behind the model. There's attention, Greek letters, etc. But uh, so in essence, what the goal is uh, that for some input, right? So for some sequence, for some uh, uh, sequence of stock uh, of n stock prices in time, right? So you want to use, for example, for for a given time, right? So the verticals here correspond to time. For a given time, you want to use just two layers, right? So then for other times you wanna use all five layers, all right? So, uh, and, and also what you carry over the so-called hidden state from one layer, uh, so from one time to the next time. So sometimes uh, for some samples, you want to have that carry over of the hidden, uh, hidden state, but on the other, in other cases, maybe you don't, all right? So, so think about sort of, you have here, uh, kind of a rigid network with one, two, so the, the lower uh, is input, right? So four layers, right? So, and on the left sample, uh, left sample sort of, it should use just uh, what you see uh, in gray, right? So, but a different sample uh, perhaps sort of wants to uh, use or the underlying architecture should be only what is on the right here, uh, on the right side of, uh, of the slide, right? So you wanna have flexibility you want the model to to dynamically uh, figure out the number of layers and the number of transfers from one layer to the next layer. So those are kind of uh, uh, arcs going from back from uh, left to right. You want the model to automatically determine that, right? So how do we do this? As I said, I'm not going to bother you with with mathematics in this regard. Uh, we essentially use ideas from attention. Uh, and, and attention sort of selects, for example, number of layers and, and which, which hidden layers you want to carry over, all right? So, so this is all I'm gonna uh, uh, talk today about uh, the aspect of, of dynamic uh, network configuration, right? So the rest I wanna focus on, on, uh, this, the, on the question of how do you dynamically make, uh, make predictions, all right? So now, Conceptually, the answer is on the paper, sort of it's very simple, right? So you want to make predictions uh, as long as you're com you are uh, uh, comfortable with, right? So, or you have confidence, I should rather say, as long as you or the model, as long as the model has confidence in making predictions, right? So, but this now raises uh, uh, the first question, which is how do we capture, quote, quantify confidence, right? So, and there's some work around confidence uh, here we use uh, some relatively simple concepts. So there's there's more complex work on how do you measure confidence uh, that would be very hard, if not impossible, to inc to incorporate in this kind of thinking, right? So we came up with with some basic notions of uh, of confidence, right? So uh, here you see them uh, at the bottom of the slide. So uh, one measure, uh, one possible measure is the maximum probability value. Another one is the entropy of the predicted uh, vector. And then you can have total variation between the current prediction and the prediction in the previous time period. You can have so-called Wassersteins between uh, the current prediction and the prediction in the previous time uh, period. And you can have uh, highest and second highest probability. For example, this is the very uh, last one uh, within, the same, uh, uh, within the same time period. All right, so so clearly, okay, so uh, if the probability is high, right, so then it means that you are very confident, not you, model. The model is very confident. If, if entropy is very high, the model is confident. If, if total variation, which means essentially captures that the current distribution, it's very similar to the previous one, it means that the model is probably uh, confident, right? And you can then uh, reason in the same way about Wassersteiner and, um, and the last one, so the, uh, highest and second highest, right? So you want the gap between highest and second highest. You want it to be high for the model to be confident, right? So we have these notions of, uh, of confidence, uh, 
um, which uh, sort of we uh, they are, they are labeled as G, all right. So and now how do we capture this into the loss function? So the the loss function in terms of how far we want to predict, all right. So we have this confidence, all right. So and uh, we okay. So first we we combine two aspects. So one is the standard. Uh, uh, prediction power uh, aspect. And so that's the first term here in the loss function. So the loss function is listed at the bottom of the slide. So it's the first term in the loss in the loss function. And in essence, you want to make predictions or you care about the accuracy of your predictions as long as your confidence is greater than tau. All right. So this is the uh, that's why you see at the bottom of the summation term, you see uh, summation g uh, greater than tau. All right. So Uh, accuracy of your predictions, uh, as long as confidence is about in our model, make uh, a single prediction. All right, so because in that case, summation is going to be empty and, and that's going to be optimal, right? So you're going to have essentially uh, uh, the model is just not going to make a single prediction, which is a very, very useless useless model, right? So you want to also encourage the model to make predictions, right? So, and to make actually many predictions. So the second term here uh, in the loss function says, well, let's make many predictions, all right? So uh, uh, you want to tau the threshold and and the confidence. All right. So this term essentially says, well, let me let me uh, make confidence uh, 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 high so that I so that I'm going to have many summation terms in the first uh, expression here. All right. So this is the loss function. And now, okay. So this is when it comes to kind of technical aspects of uh, of this work. All right. So I'm going to, due to the lack of time, I'm going to skip this training tricks. Uh, uh, but data. All right, so we have, uh, I have a variety of different uh, data sets. So one is five commodities, so the other data set, uh, so five commodities over a span of, I think, 10 years prices, right? So the five minute uh, tick data. Uh, then I have 22 ETFs and 50 futures. So these are three different data sets. Okay, some, some results will be presented uh, with respect to commodities, others with respect to ETFs and others with respect to futures. All right, so uh, how do we create classes? So we have uh, five classes. So uh, uh, one class is uh, between uh, um, minus one standard deviation and one standard deviation of the price. Another class is one and two standard deviations. The, the third class is minus one and minus two standard deviations. Uh, and then the fourth one is above two standard deviations. And the fifth one is below minus two standard deviations. All right, so we are, so we are, turning this into a, a classification problem with five classes. Uh, so input features, right? So we didn't do any feature engineering because the CNN and LCM portion should take care of that, all right? So our, fe our features are essentially just deltas, right? So the return, uh, so the return between one time, so uh, time here is uh, five minutes, right? So every five minutes between one and the previous time and predictions, for example, for stock one, up, down for stock two, up, up, right? So up meaning uh, uh, meaning uh, one standard deviation, uh, and then let's say two standard deviation would be extremely up, uh, or whatever you want to uh, name that, right? So up and then down, etc. Right? So so these are these are the predictions that we want to make, and clearly from historical data we can get the ground uh, we can get ground truth. All right. So here is uh, so I'm going now into uh, computational. Uh, experiments, and now I'm going to cover only select uh, charts. Um, so on the on the left uh, chart, we see all right. So uh, we see varying PI means varying prediction uh, inference. All right. So so this is okay. So first of all, I should say uh, epochs is uh, so we do walk forward strategy. All right. So all evaluations are, back, are based on uh, walk forward uh, strategies. And epochs is essentially a uh, uh, number of uh, walk forward steps, all right? So and this is all based on uh, predictions. Uh, I think we retrain the model every 
two weeks, no, every one month, I think, because we actually have a lot of data. Every one month we retrain the model. All right, so uh, the uh, the data is is quite unbalanced, right? So, and you can guess this because there are not that many classes uh, with uh, plus two standard deviations and, and below minus two standard deviations. So that's why we report the F1 score, All right? So, and you see here that the purple one, which is the varying, so the purple, purple and green are two different uh, uh, versions of this uh, prediction, uh, dynamic uh, prediction length, all right? So this one, this here, all right? So, and you see that, uh, so the purple one, right? So the purple one outperforms all others that don't have, so, oops, sorry. All right, so blue, for example, uh, makes a fixed prediction, I think five, uh, five times five, 25 minutes into the future, uh and uh, and all other curves okay so all other curves make fixed predictions but the purple pink uh purple the purple curve at the top all right so this is the one that makes dynamic predictions and you see that it actually achieves the best f1 score among all models all right so um so the improvement is uh, is is quite good right so it would be interesting to know uh how how does this improvement translate into the actual quote money right so when it comes to trading all right so here let me um let me focus now here on the uh, uh bar chart on the right all right so here we have the 22 etfs all right so and uh and how far into the future model on average the model predicts for these 22 etfs and you see that, that there's quite a lot of uh, variability right so for some ETFs, the model is the model decides to predict only two periods in a, uh, into the future. For some, actually, just one. All right, so that will be just five minutes into the future. When you see two, it means ten minutes into the future. But you see that uh, if you look at those uh, high bars, right? So you see that for some ETFs, the model is actually very confident, and and it's and it makes predictions what six, seven, uh, eight. So that will be times four, right? Thirty-two. Uh, times five, sorry, 30 to 40 minutes in, in advance. All right, so you see that, that the model is able to actually differentiate between different uh, ETFs, and it's making shorter predictions for some ETFs and longer predictions for other, uh, uh, for other uh, ETFs. All right, so, and, uh, and the numbers here that you see, 60, 72, the, the numbers above uh, bars, those numbers actually measure uh, uh, measure volatility of the underlying ETFs, and it's very intuitive, right? So expected that those that have high volatility, uh, sorry, low volatility, uh, it should be okay. So it's the inverse of volatility, sorry, all right? So those that have low volatility, they are predicted uh, uh, very high into uh, advance or far, sorry, very far into advance. Those that have low volatility, they are predicted uh, very. Uh, 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 so, or, sorry, those that, are, those that have high volatility, the model predicts only five, 10 minutes in advance uh, into the future. And those that have low volatility, the model predicts 30 to 40 minutes in, into the future. All right, so this is expected. So the model uh, kind of functions the way, uh, the way we expect it to function. All right, so I'm running out of time. All right, so skipping this. All right, so number of layers. All right, so this is the, the, this is the dynamic uh, aspect. So I wanna show you here dynamic uh, dynamic uh, uh, network architecture based on samples, all right? So, and this is, uh, so here, what you see in this bar chart is uh, essentially the number of layers that the model selects for, for uh, overall samples, all right? So for some samples, what you see here is that for some samples in the first period, it selects two layers, for others, it selects just one layer, all right? So then from periods two to, uh, what is this, 20, uh, for some reason, it always selects just one layer, right? So, but then from 20 to 25, for some, it selects two layers and for others, it selects one layer, right? So this tells us that the model is able to distinguish that for some, some samples are harder. So it wants to use two layers. Other samples are easier. It wants to use just one layer, right? So what are, what are the improvements when it comes to, um, so when it comes to using this multiple layer, so in terms of just F1, there's not a lot of improvement. So just look at the table here. The F1 goes from 0 0.4, 0 0.53 to 0 0.54, right? So, but again, it's, 
it would be interesting to translate that into monetary values. All right, so I'm almost done. Um, yeah, all right. So this is, again, this is F1. If you have dynamic, uh, these are several scenarios, all right? So if you have dynamic uh, number of, uh, of layers versus if you don't have, and you see, so whenever you see the top one, so the middle one, right? so this is where you have the middle bar is always for different data sets and different uh, uh, scenarios. All right, so the middle one is uh, is dynamic network configuration, and you see that that uh, F1 it's always the largest. All right, so summary. Um, so if you just use uh, vanilla CNN plus RNN, right? So you get a F1 of 0.25, but then if you throw into the mix uh, uh, attention and our dynamic uh, network architecture you actually bumped it up to 0.5, right? So here up to 0.5, okay? And you, we saw it's actually even above 0.5, 0.54, right? So this is this is quite a drastic improvement, right? So, but to get to from 0.25 to 0.5, it's not just, uh, truth to be told, it's not just our network architecture and dynamic, uh, pre and dynamic predictions. Uh, it's, um, it, it's also, you have to do some other tricks such as teacher forcing, and, uh, and we did some other sort of tricks that were uh, not substantial, okay? But every trick sort of uh, uh, leads into the substantial uh, improvement. All right, so the, the key part, the key uh, uh, moral of the story here is uh, that uh, uh, textbook models, I mean, they work, all right? So, but if you uh, uh, pull a bag of, first of all, uh, uh, tricks known uh, known in the literature, such as teacher forcing, etc. You can uh, increase and attention. You can increase the performance. But then, if you use this these Taylor's models that I have just suggested, sort of you can further uh, improve by. So here you see the the top two blue ones, point one and point three. All right. So that's that's a conclusion. All right. So it's a uh, it pays off to the extra effort. Uh, in developing the models and then implementing, etc., uh, so it pays off when it comes to F1. All right, so thanks, thank you very much. So if you have further questions, feel free to email me or tweet. Uh, so the my handle is d at uh, d Clavian. All right, so thank you very much again. I apologize for the uh, for the initial technical issues. Thank you so much, Diego. Um, we are a little bit running behind, but I think we've got a few couple a couple minutes for questions. So I'm just going to read some off for you, Diego. Um, Rob asked, does each asset or asset type behave differently? Does transferring to a new, to, is, is transferring to a new asset required? Uh, regard, sure. sorry, I didn't, no problem. I didn't catch the question. I mean, uh, I the, qu the question you... Robin read is, sorry, not required, retraining. Does each asset or asset type behave Whoa. differently? Does transferring to, to a new asset require retraining? Sorry. Okay, yeah, that. I mean, yeah, <laughs> retraining, that. that's what, yeah, no problem. Uh, so yes, yes, but right, so, so we, uh, so for commodities, for the commodity data set sort of, uh, we train it separately from ETFs uh, and ETFs were trained trained separately from uh, from futures, right? So, but uh, but I also said that, uh, I also mentioned that we do walk forward, right? So where we retrain uh, every month, at the end of every single month, we retrain uh, the model. Now we start from the weights in the previous uh, time period. Okay, period. thank you. <clears throat> um, Eric asked, uh, apparently you said, attention is used to select between two or five layers. Are there two, predefined architectures or can there be thousands of different ones? Is this idea similar to learning the distribution of the input data? Um, so no, so well, it's, at least sort of explicitly, we are not trying to learn the distribution of the input data. So it's not, so we don't have a, a generative model, um, but it's a good, it's a good uh, thought. Um, I mean, it's a good thought that perhaps this, these dynamic configurations could actually lead into generative models that that uh, uh, that would capture distributions uh, uh, 
uh, over the data. But we have not we we haven't approached it from that perspective, right? So it, it's a good okay. good thought, all right? So uh, make make sure you follow up with Diego, Eric. <laughs> um, yeah. Sir, how do you manage multi-stock training? Any particular scaling of the loss? Uh, scaling of the law. So we are not, we have not encountered any issues when it comes to uh, law scaling. And I don't think we even, we even do, uh, actually I'm confident so that we don't do uh, gradient clipping, um, but there's no need to do gradient clipping because of this, because of the dynamic architecture okay. that's behind that we are using. Okay. Because dynamic, dynamic architecture um, is, Sort of it automatically. Uh, sort of it selects sort of uh, simple, simple, simple networks uh, auto, uh, automatically for many samples, and for simple, simple networks, sort of gradients are not that okay. that much of an issue. Listen, uh, I, there are other questions, but but unfortunately, we are uh, sort of at, at our eleventh hour, so to speak. So uh, for all those on the chat, if I didn't get your question, I'm, as Diego said, he's he's welcome to for you to reach out. He's shared his email address as well as LinkedIn uh, address, so please reach out. Thank you, Diego, so much. Apologies again for the technical difficulties. I'm sure it wasn't your fault. <laughs> it's usually, we need to create a, an, uh, a machine learning uh, algorithm to get all these webinars working a lot better because they never do and they're not going away. So Diego, thank you so much for your time. I look forward to connecting with you outside of this event. For everyone on the call, please go back into the general room, check out the stage, check out the expo. There are some prizes to be won from the uh, different companies that are proposing there. And Diego, I hope to see you throughout the rest of the day. Thank you so much, sir. Yes, thank you very much.